Okay, well, here it is, the last installment in our seven-week fall series. We've been working with this wonderful book up here called Finding Yourself in Transition by Reverend Robert Brummett, Using Life's Changes for Spiritual Awakening. And we've been through the three phases of uh, all of the uh, transitions and the sub-phases, and uh, we've been through the ending, we've been through the wilderness experience and we've been through the new beginning so today we ask the question after the new beginning is it possible to live beyond change and when i say live beyond change i don't mean living without change that's impossible <clears throat> or or living in denial of the reality of change because that would be dysfunctional I mean finding a way to actually embrace change so that we don't get carried along on the roller coaster ride of all the peaks, the valleys, the highs and the lows where we go from being thrilled by a, I don't know, a new discovery, an achievement, a, a success in our life, and then from there back into the apprehension and anxiety when things don't go according to plan. And roller coasters are, are fun. But, but not that kind, not, not that kind of roller coaster. That's the one we want to try to avoid. And, and uh, our Buddhist friends, they have a term for a state of consciousness that can really help us to uh, smooth out the peaks and the valleys a bit. They call it equanimity. Equanimity, which means a consciousness characterized by peace and tranquility, especially in the face of difficulties and challenges. There's a great little story that's told by Pima Chodron, who's a very well-known teacher in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. I think we have a picture of her up here. Yeah, there she is. She wrote a book called Start Where You Are. She wrote several books, but this is one of her more well-known ones, Start Where You Are. Another one of her books is called The Places That Scare You, and so uh, interesting titles. And uh, this is a guide to compassionate living. And in this book, she tells a, a story about an ancient Buddhist teacher known as Milarepa. She calls him one of the heroes, one of the brave ones, a very crazy, unusual fellow. He was a loner who lived in caves by himself and meditated wholeheartedly for years. He was extremely stubborn and determined. If he could not find anything to eat for even a couple of years, he would just eat nettles. And then he turned green. <laughs> but he never stopped practicing. And by the way, that's why whenever you see him depicted in, in Tibetan iconography like this, you will see him with a, a different shades of green because the legend goes that he would eat nettles and drink nettle tea, and he turned green. That's the story. So, one evening... Milarepa returned to his cave after gathering firewood, only to find it filled with demons. And here he is, returning to his cave with his fire, uh, firewood, confronted by demons. And they were cooking his food, eating his food, reading his books, sleeping in his bed. It must have been a pretty nice cave when you think about it. He had books in a bed and you know, lots of food and things. But uh, basically, the demons had taken over the joint. Now... Milarepa knew about non-duality of self and other, but he still did not quite know how to get these guys out of his cave. Even though he had the sense that they were just a projection of his own mind, all of the unwanted parts of himself, he did not know how to get rid of them. So first, he preached at them. He taught them the Dharma. He sat on a seat that was higher than they were, as is the Buddhist teaching tradition, and he said things to them about how we're all one. He talked about compassion and shunyata, which is the Buddhist word for the void or wilderness. He talked about how poison is medicine and great paradoxes like that. <laughs> Nothing happened. The demons were still there. So next, he lost his patience. He lost his temper. He got very angry and he ran at them. They just laughed at him. Finally, he gave up 
and sat down on the floor, saying, I am not going away, and it looks like you are not either. So let us just live here together. And at that point, all of them left, <laughs> except one. Milarepa said, Oh, this one is particularly vicious. And we all know that one. Sometimes we have lots of them like that. Sometimes we feel that is all that we have. He did not know what to do. So he just surrendered himself even further. He walked over and he put himself right into the mouth of the demon and said, just eat me up if you want to. And then that demon left too. The moral of the story is when the resistance is gone, so are the demons. It's a story about fearlessness. It's a story about courage, a willingness to be present and open to whatever arises in our lives, regardless of what we call it, whether we label it a demon or something else. The idea is to be curious instead of fearful about whatever comes up. Curious. And not only to embrace it, but to get to know it intimately. She tells us in her book that our usual response to the demons in life is fear. If we're honest with ourselves, that's what comes up first. And one of the problems we have is that modern demons are not easily and instantly recognizable by their fangs and claws and bad smell or whatever it happens to be that characterizes demons, they come to us in more subtle forms. Unwanted feelings, unwanted thoughts, circumstances. We want to get rid of them, so we resist them. And that's when they laugh at us and make themselves right at home. What we learn from the story of Milarepa is that the key to non-resistance, equanimity, and getting rid of an infestation of demons is self-awareness. Milarepa had to become aware of the fact that these demons were actually something that he was projecting, resisting, and helping to create. We help to create the demons. We make them feel at home because they start out as our feelings our emotions, and our running commentary on the circumstances that are surrounding us. So those are the kind of things we want to be aware of. Our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, from moment to moment as they unfold. And another name for that kind of self-awareness is something we talk about a lot here. It's called mindfulness, and it is one of the spiritual practices that is receiving some degree of scientific validation as a way to actually achieve greater and lasting peace and happiness in our lives. This is the February issue of Time Magazine. I may have shown this to you before. It has the, uh, it's just from February of this year, the Mindful Revolution. It's a timely topic. And uh, now there is actually an entire magazine that's devoted to the topic of mindfulness, and it is called, you guessed it, Mindful. Mindful. Yes, there it is. And for you football fans, this is the latest issue featuring Pete Carroll, former head coach at USC and now the head coach of the Super Bowl winning Seattle Seahawks. So this is becoming mainstream. They're featuring a lot of different people who are leaders in business, leaders in the media, and each one of these covers who are talking about their own experiences with, with mindfulness. It's an interesting process and it's something that we see gaining, gaining momentum. It's becoming mainstream. And one of the first things that we learn in mindfulness practice is how to deal with our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our sensations by simply labeling them. And when I say simply labeling them, that's exactly what I mean. Keep it simple. A thought it's just a thought. A thought that arises, oh, it's a thought. A sensation that arises in the body, oh, there's a, a sensation, an itch, whatever it happens to be. 
Keep it simple. An emotion is just an emotion. When we practice labeling our internal experiences with words, we learn how to avoid getting consumed by the demons of our self-critical thoughts and emotions. And we can try a little thought experiment right now just to kind of see how that might work. Imagine looking at your reflection in a mirror. Okay, it's interesting because often we're not just aware of seeing our physical body, are we? Nope. We start the commentary pretty quick, like, oh, where, where'd the gray hair come from? Or in my case, uh, where'd the hair go? <laughs> Is that really me? Why does there seem to be so much more of me? <laughs> we add a judgment, like, wow, I look old. And then we add an emotional response to that, like dismay, and then we get carried off by the utter futility of wanting things to be different than the way they are in the mirror, which is exactly the opposite of equanimity. And it sure doesn't help matters that we're surrounded and bombarded by messages that tell us that gray hair and wrinkles are problems that we need to get rid of, cover up, whatever. Another example of how we get programmed to see the natural cycles of life as something to be afraid of, as something to resist, avoid, or manipulate. The demons want us to be afraid. That's how they make a nest in our consciousness. And I can't help thinking that there are influences at work in our culture that want us to live in a state of fear. Fear, anxiety, apprehension, suspicion, whatever. Every time the news comes on, they're going to tell you about some dire thing that's looming. Thing, and sometimes they even say, should you be afraid of this? We'll tell you. You know, stand by for 6 o'clock. We're going to tell you all the things that you need to be afraid of this week, right? It's ruthless. It's hard to get away with. So when I say that it's programmed, maybe we should think of it just like, just like software that's been downloaded against our will, like a virus perhaps, that's always running in the background. You know, people will take their computer to... Uh, I don't know, the geeks or a technician or something, because it's running too slow, and they're astounded when the technician shows them all of the garbage programs that are running in the background and the viruses and the malware and crap like that. I like to say that mindfulness is like running a computer cleanup tool. We get rid of the viruses, we get rid of the unwanted programs and the garbage and the stuff that's running in the background, and we get to decide what programs we want running in our life. That's a starting point for equanimity. And in our book, Robert tells us, we've probably already figured this out, that another name for equanimity is surrender. To surrender fully is to be open in a deep way to each experience of our life. It means to allow ourselves to feel fully each response to the events and the circumstances of our life. So surrender isn't running away, it's being fully open to a deeper experience. That's what Milarepa did in the cave, right? He not only sat down with the demons and welcomed them, but he put his head right into the mouth of the biggest and meanest looking one. He wasn't being a doormat. He wasn't giving up. He wasn't engaging in complacency and despair. He had attained the wisdom to be able to discern that this approach, his approach, was the best way to deal with the demons and the situation in that moment. Mindfulness keeps us open to the wellspring of wisdom that flows from within. As Robert puts it in the book again, he says, we can say and do what is necessary to protect and assert ourselves in the world. Being surrendered means that we don't try to control and orchestrate the flow of our life. We let life unfold. Yes, we ask for what we want. We voice our opinion 
when appropriate, and we act when we need to act. But we are not attached to the result. That makes all the difference. Karen and I had a, an interesting lesson back in 2001 where we learned a little something about not trying to control and orchestrate the flow of our lives. I think I shared with you earlier in the series, um, 2001, I would have been in my wilderness experience after I left my law practice, took a year off getting ready to start uh, ministerial school at Unity Institute. Uh, but Karen was still working. She, uh, at that time, she owned a, a company that had a contract to provide consulting and training and uh, instructional design materials for um, a little outfit known as uh, United Airlines. You, you might have heard of them. <laughs> we got married in June of 2001. Things were going along nicely. We planned to start school in 2002, kind of had things kind of had things mapped out, and then September 11th happened. Everybody knows what happened to airline travel after September 11th. And profits. Right. No more contract with United. All contracts were canceled. All consulting work was, was done. It took about four or five years before the airlines got back on their feet after that event. In fact, it was a mini recession after September 11th, if you recall that. A lot of investments tanked, companies weren't hiring, and we could not have picked a worse time to do what we were getting ready to do. And that's exactly the point. We didn't pick it. We didn't pick the time. We didn't pick or choose for that to happen. It was a part of the way that life was unfolding. And the first thing I did was I read our book again, finding ourselves and finding ourselves, finding yourself, finding myself in transition. I think it was the second time that I read the book. And as a result of that, instead of um, <laughs> scrambling around, trying to control things, wasting a lot of time trying to find a job, any job, or a source of income, we simply decided to put the house on the market, downsize, and do what we had planned to do just sooner instead of later. And it was a good thing, as it turns out, because um, you know houses were not selling very well either after September 11th, the real estate market took a, a mini downturn. So we figured out that we were going to end up having to actually move twice. Isn't that a lovely thought? The idea of moving twice within, you know, six to eight months. We'd have to move once in Illinois after the house sold and get a place to, you know, stay there until we were ready to make the big move. And then again in 2002, when we went down to, to Missouri, assuming we got into school, we didn't know at that point. Well, as it turned out, because of the downturn, the house didn't sell for almost six months. We got the offer while we were actually at Unity Village being interviewed and tested and all the stuff that they do, being, being, being poked and prodded to <laughs> see if you're minister material. Uh, we got the offer when we were there. Literally, I don't know, we, we were, came out of some test and there was a phone message and they said, hey, you got an offer. We said, yeah, we'll take it. And um, yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> And the closing happened, uh, I think it was a couple of months later, the closing happened on the very same day, Karen did the closing in St. Charles, Illinois, on the same day that I was down in Missouri getting the keys to our new house in Blue Springs, Missouri. So, <laughs> look at that. No overlap, no moving twice, no double mortgage payments or anything like that. Now, I can't say that it happened because we did anything in particular, but we did let go and surrender and let the circumstances unfold, and that certainly made things a lot easier, way easier, both mentally and, and physically. So, even though our seven-week fall series is officially coming to an end, we know that change never comes to an end. And so I recommend keeping this book on your, on your bookshelf and remembering the story of 
Milarepa and what to do when you find your cave, the cave of your consciousness, infested by demons, either within you or things outside that you consider to be a demon. Be curious. Learn to embrace them. Learn to go with the flow and trust that we have that higher power, that fount of wisdom within us that we can unleash when we put ourselves in that state of equanimity. So, change goes on, and next Sunday we are changing into the first Sunday of the Advent season. Um, another word for change is transformation. Next week the sanctuary will be transformed. We'll have a big old Christmas tree up here, and John Dufour will be with us, and so I hope you can join us, and I hope to see you in for our potluck here in just a few minutes. So, thank you.